Hello everyone and welcome to this, the final episode in our series Lumen Gentium, our weekly look through Christmas Tide and Epiphany Tide at the themes of the various liturgies. And of course, there has been so much, so much to cover, so much to reflect upon. Um, apologies that uh, last week uh, there wasn't an episode. Uh, I'm afraid I wasn't very well. Um, but uh, suffice to say that um, essentially uh, the main thrust of what would have been uh, last week's uh, discussion uh, would have focused on uh, the third Sunday after Epiphany. Uh, with well, the essential theme there, of course, is the healing uh, of the leper and of the centurion servant. The point being made there, re our revelatory theme of Epiphany of Christ's divinity being, being revealed uh, by the working of healing uh, miracles. Now, there are another two uh, Sundays, often, uh, of Epiphany Tide, uh, depending on when Easter falls and that's on when Ash Wednesday falls. Um, but this year, Epiphany Tide uh, then uh, finished, really, uh, with uh, that third Sunday, as yesterday, of course, was Septuagesima. Now, I won't talk about Septuagesima today, because uh, that will be uh, content for another series, uh, which, of course, will be following. Um, so instead, we're going to focus uh, on tomorrow's liturgy, which is the end of Christmas Tide and Epiphany Tide proper, and that is Candlemas, also known, of course, more officially as the presentation of Christ in the temple and the purification of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Now, hopefully, of course, what you will have immediately recognised and what you will know about Candlemas from that um, popularised uh, title is the fact that it is all about light. And in many ways, we can say that through this season, uh, the theme of light, this light motif, um, has uh, been ever-present and grown. So that, of course, through Advent, we were uh, remembering the words of Isaiah, the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. Uh, at Christmas, of course, uh, the light was revealed, but only to a few, to the shepherds and to Our Lady. Then at Epiphany, uh, the light was revealed uh, more widely uh, to the church. Uh, and of course then by extension uh, to the Gentiles and to the whole world and lastly now on uh, Candlemas uh, the light of the world is revealed for all um, and uh, most importantly and chiefly to ourselves we ourselves of course will receive um, a candle well some of us, those of us who are able, fortunate enough to be able to attend uh, the liturgy uh, for Candlemas, uh, will receive a candle in their hands. Uh, unfortunately and sadly, of course, uh, many of us, because of the uh, various uh, restrictions uh, imposed uh, because of the pandemic by various governments, will not be able to attend Candlemas uh, nor to receive a candle. Nonetheless, uh, I'm sure that I will not be alone uh, in offering the sacred liturgy tomorrow, uh, in part because it is traditional on Candlemas Day for all the candles uh, to be used, um, possibly throughout the church's year, um, are to be blessed uh, during the blessing of candles at the beginning of the liturgy, and also candles themselves to be distributed um, as sacramentals to the faithful. So even though uh, the faithful won't be able to be present, I will still bless candles for the faithful to have when they are able uh, to receive and collect them. Um, and I'm sure other uh, clergy will do the same. But it does mean that, to quote uh, the venerable um, uh, Monsignor Adrian Fortescue, uh, who, write, who wrote, of course, uh, Ceremonies of the Roman Rite uh, Prescribed, uh, a great uh, volume that uh, goes through the rubrics of the liturgy, he makes a very important salient point there where he says um, that it is uh, never right to mutilate the liturgy for convenience, meaning that of course tomorrow, even though uh, we will bless candles, we will still have to have a procession, even though it will be me on my own, uh, 
Um, but nonetheless, there we go. Um, so I will still have to have a procession if I bless the candles. If you don't bless the candles, then you don't have the procession. That's how the rubrics work. Um, another interesting side, of course, to that is that uh, when the 2nd of February falls, say, for example, um, on a, a greater um, uh, feast, or meaning that the feast of the presentation has to be uh, moved, um, then the ceremony of the blessing of candles still occurs um, before whatever the liturgy of the day is. Um, so anyway, um, I will bless uh, candles tomorrow uh, anyway and will process anyway uh, just to be able to provide sacramentals uh, to our faithful here. But the point of course is that everyone uh, who would be otherwise able to attend uh, the sacred liturgy on candle mass would receive a candle and the other candles that are blessed uh, of course uh, will be for the use of the altar for use um, at baptisms um, and uh, for votives uh, throughout the year um, now why candles um, what what's so special uh, about candles now there are all sorts of uh, reasons given as to why uh, candles feature um, in the liturgy of Candlemas. Uh, there is uh, a long uh, view um, held by many scholars uh, that, as with uh, so often with other liturgies, um, the bishops in Rome introduced the procession with candles to supplant um, a pagan um, procession which otherwise happened uh, in the capital of the empire. When the uh, empire uh, came to full faith uh, and the bishops of Rome began to have greater influence over what went on in the capital streets um, so they gradually um, adopted uh, some of the um, pagan traditions and Christianized them. Uh, we might think for example of uh, Rogation Tide, uh, the traditional uh, procession uh, with reciting the litany imploring God's blessing uh, on the crops and on the harvest. Um, regalia uh, was originally something that the pagans did though it has to be also pointed out uh, that the Hebrews likewise uh, also um, held processions and asked God's blessing uh, seasonally on the crops and on the harvest so not an entirely pagan thing uh, but anyway uh, in Rome certainly it had been uh, and it was Christianized well likewise um, so too with um, uh, the uh, pagan feast of Lupercalia, um, which featured nocturnal torchlight processions. Now, it's very interesting that this feast of Candlemas, or the Feast of the Presentation of the Lord, um, we know dates back um, certainly to the 3rd, 4th um, uh, century um, in the East, in Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, it occurred with lights, but not with a procession, until um, it is recorded that a pilgrim uh, from Rome uh, came to Jerusalem, was present for uh, the, uh, this uh, feast um, and introduced, suggested, uh, mentioned uh, the use of torches. And so a procession uh, there became uh, part of the liturgy. And then later, uh, when the feast of the presentation itself uh, began to be celebrated in Rome, so uh, the procession with uh, candles and torches uh, was instituted. Now the other interesting thing about candle mass of course is candles themselves. Why do we make uh, such a fuss about candles? Um, and in this regard um, few people perhaps today appreciate uh, that candles uh, were considered, have always been considered special by the church, not just because of the uh, obvious uh, symbol of light and Christ, of course, I am the light of the world, um, but also because beeswax itself, from which originally candles were made, were all made, um, was connotes uh, virginity. Connotes virginity. Why? Um, because the worker bees who make the honey um, are themselves virgins and chaste. In a bee colony, in a beehive, 
uh, you have your queen bee at the center of it all and then you have your drone bees um, of which there are about 15 uh, and uh, the uh, queen and the drones are the only ones involved within the hive in reproduction all the other bees all the worker bees all the ones who go off and collect the hun uh, collect the pollen and bring it back to the hive and make the honey and even who make the royal jelly um, they um, are all virgins and are all chaste and that's why beeswax um, has always been so highly prized by the church indeed um, uh, various times uh, various stipulations have been made uh, about the percentage uh, of beeswax that candles should be made of um, the least of which I think is 51 percent um, so re of course this feast itself um, speaking to the virginity of Christ uh, and also to of course to the virginity of the Blessed Virgin Mary um, also read the connotations of light um, beeswax and candles um, plays then uh, lends itself lends lend themselves um, to the uh, themes uh, being commemorated uh, in this uh, feast so that's why uh, candles are always made such a fuss of uh, in the church because they represent themselves virginity and indeed St Augustine um, says more about that um, if I can just find the quote sorry not St Augustine it was St Anselm Archbishop of Canterbury um, he says the blessed candle the wax the wick and the flame the wax he says which is the production of the virginal bee is the flesh of our Lord the wick which is within it is his soul and the flame which burns on top is his divinity St John Chrysostom also wrote the bee is more honored than other animals not because it labors but because it labors for others because it labors for others now that's an interesting insight um, so not just about uh, the chastity of the worker bee not just about the fact that it lives its life as a virgin but also too that it lives to serve it lives to work for others obviously in the colony it lives to work for the queen bee and for the drones and for the other members of the hive but here then too we are remembered we are reminded of the general vocation of us all as Christians which is of course to serve God's will we are all called to serve others we are called to serve God first and then to serve our neighbors and of course in uh, our Lord and in Our Lady we find uh, the perfect model uh, of service and humility uh, and of chastity and of purity and ultimately then of course of sacrifice again sacrifice is a key part of Christian liturgy um, you study any of the uh, major world faiths and uh, they all have uh, an aspect of sacrifice in them uh, but in Christianity, in Catholicism, certainly we might say uh, we see the epitome of sacrifice, of offering, uh, both in terms of Christ and his supreme offering of himself, um, but also to uh, we, uh, the living of the Christian faith, we are all called to live sacrificially for God and for others. And this is expressed uh, in uh, the Mass, and in everything that is connected uh, with the Mass uh, so that the offering of the uh, candles of the beeswax uh, connotes um, sacrifice um, the labor and intensity uh, and uh, endeavor that goes into uh, creating the vestments uh, and uh, the paraments uh, they all speak of sacrifice sacrifice of talent sacrifice of time sacrifice of inspiration um, and skills um, likewise ordinarily uh, the organist the scholar or the choir 
um, they offer they offer a, a real sacrifice in offering the music um, and indeed all of us who are present at mass likewise are offering ourselves our souls and bodies um, to God as a living sacrifice um, so all of these themes too um, are relevant um, and in various ways touched upon or highlighted uh, in the uh, liturgy and themes of Candlemas. Now, what does Candlemas itself then as a feast, uh, what primarily uh, is its focus? Well, of course, it is a double feast. In the first instance, we might say that the prime purpose um, is that for which um, uh, the Greeks termed it hippotantes, uh, meaning the meeting. Uh, referring to the presentation of Christ in the temple, uh, referring to the meeting uh, by Simeon and by the prophetess Anna. Uh, they both meet uh, the incarnation, they both meet the Christ child, the Messiah in the temple. God and the Christ child meet each other in the temple. Um, Our Lady, of course, is meeting in the temple Simeon and Anna and God and, of course, offering the Christ child to God. So in the first instance the liturgy is all about this presentation of Christ in the temple and about meeting. About you know because what is a temple for? But it is a meeting place between heaven and earth. And the second theme is the purification of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Now this speaks to the Mosaic law uh, that required that after the birth of a male child um, a woman presented herself uh, at the temple uh, for ritual um, purification uh, which simply involved a prayer of thanksgiving uh, in deliv for the delivery, the safe delivery of a child um, and for a blessing uh, upon the mother. Um, and this of course became a Christian tradition known as the churching of women. Uh, those of you who watched Old Romans Unscripted um, last Saturday and uh, I hopefully uh, will know all about uh, the churching of women we discussed it then and it is a practice that uh, gradually is uh, uh, being practiced uh, again uh, in recent times um, so Our Lady comes with Christ now the other thing is is that she comes to fulfill the law not just in terms of her own uh, uh, right for purification but also to present um, the Christ child and to offer um, a sacrifice in thanksgiving for the gift of the firstborn and that's why we read uh, from St Luke of course uh, that they brought uh, turtle doves uh, to offer in sacrifice this as uh, again all about sacrifice and this as an expression of thanksgiving and of love uh, toward God. So that's why uh, we have the Feast of the Presentation, why we have uh, the Feast of the Purification, um, because of those, because of the fulfillment um, of the law. The interesting thing, of course, is that Our Lady and Our Lord are always careful to observe uh, the law of Moses. And this is a, an important point because uh, remember that our Lord himself later will say, uh, I have not come to displace the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them or to bring them to completion. Um, and so our Lord was circumcised. He didn't need to be circumcised in the same way that he wasn't beholden to the covenant as others were, but humbling himself uh, and sharing in our humanity, he humbled himself to, to uh, the divine law and precepts given by God to humanity. And likewise, Our Lady, who, of course, being the Virgin of Virgins, no one is purer than Our Lady. She didn't need any right of purification as such. Um, but nonetheless, uh, in all humility, she uh, subjects herself uh, to the law. And there is a very important lesson um, for all of us as Christians, um, not just for uh, clerics, not just for uh, religious, uh, but for all of us as Christians. Uh, we are all called primarily to obedience, to obedience, obedience to God, 
to God and his commandments. And indeed, that is, we might say, the sine qua non of what it means to be a Christian, is uh, to offer oneself, to recognise one's life comes from God, to offer to seek to give it back to God, and in doing so to accept and obey God's commandments, to accept his way uh, and his desire for our way of living. Um, and by doing so, of course, uh, we then are overcoming uh, the rebellious spirit. In that way, we are rejecting Satan um, by submitting ourselves to obedience to God. That is what separates us from the, dem uh, from the demons and uh, from the evil spirits who, of course, refuse to submit to God's authority. Um, so obedience is a, a, a very key and important element to Christian living. Um, it's, more of us, I think, need to remember uh, and to practice uh, that. Um, it's, it's very difficult for people, I think, sometimes to appreciate nor understand, but um, when we become a Christian, uh, when we are baptised, uh, when we are made one with God in Christ, when we are made citizens of heaven, we become subject to um, God's law. Um, our lives are not our own anymore. They have been uh, given, surrendered, offered to God. And part of the um, uh, purpose of the Christian life is to conform ourselves to God's way of living. And that, of course, is where we all struggle. Uh, that is the um, constant dichotomy of the Christian life, um, the internal struggle uh, between ourselves and our natures. Um, but nonetheless, um, that is what it means to be uh, the chosen people of God, to be the new Israel. Israel, of course, meaning one who wrestles or struggles um, with God. So again, so all these things too um, are connected uh, uh, with uh, the liturgy of Candle Mass. So speaking to the liturgy itself, now in the traditional um, Latin rite, uh, we have what is variously termed a four mass. Now this may or may not speak um, to the possibility that in times past there were perhaps two masses, uh, a one mass primarily focused perhaps on the presentation, another mass perhaps focused on the purification, we don't know. What we do know is, is that uh, the liturgy for candle mass has this four mass and then a true mass. Um, for example, um, uh, Palm Sunday is, uh, is, is, is another occasion when, uh, in the traditional rite, uh, clearly at one time there was a mass for the um, blessing of palms, then the procession, and then another mass for the entry, uh, commemorating the entry uh, of our Lord into Jerusalem. So this or may, may not have uh, stemmed from a similar um, uh, um, scenario. Um, but this four mass then has an introit um, itself. And And it begins, the liturgy begins with five blessings, five prayers that are said uh, over uh, the candles. Now, everything for the blessing uh, part of the liturgy is offered in violet vestments. Why? Why violet vestments? Well, it may be, of course, um, that um, Lupercalia that we referred to earlier, the pagan festival that um, was displaced by uh, the procession at Candlemas, um, it may have been as an expression of um, penitence to, to be the antithesis 
of what the pagan festival had been about, which was, as usual with most pagan festivals, um, all about frolicking and, and licentiousness. Um, so when the Bishop of Rome introduced the procession of Candlemas to counter uh, that previous tradition of Lupercalia, it may well have been uh, that for that reason that they gave it a penitential theme. We have a writer uh, um, describing one of the early, uh, seeing one of the early processions of Candlemas in Rome and who says that the litany um, was recited uh, in procession, was sung in procession, and the phrase Kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy upon us, was oft repeated. Um, but also, of course, as you will be hopefully familiar with, those of you who are familiar with the traditional rite will know that violet is the colour of preparation and the colour of expectation. Um, so that uh, violet is always worn on vigils, uh, vigils or, or, or even eaves, um, but uh, vigils uh, the day before a great feast, so the day before Feast of the Apostles, um, uh, the day before uh, some Feast of the Lord, there is um, a vigil, uh, and the vigil wears violet. Likewise, the penitential seasons of Advent and Lent, yes, they are uh, penitential, uh, but they are also preparatory. They are also um, uh, offered with a, uh, an air of expectation. Uh, they are preparing us for a great festival. Advent, of course, preparing us for Christmas and the Feast of the Nativity. Lent, uh, preparing us for um, Holy Week and uh, the great celebration of Easter. Uh, in fact, um, Holy Week itself really is, is, a, is a, uh, an even deepened as it were, a sense of, um, of, of uh, penitential um, uh, expression. So violet liturgically always speaks to us of preparation and expectation. Um, likewise, uh, violet, of course, is worn for um, the sacrament of penance. Um, again, expressing penitence, but also to expectation, expressing hope uh, of absolution. Uh, and thus of regaining uh, salvation. So, when Candlemas, with Candlemas, the uh, liturgy of the blessing of the candles, the four mass, as it's sometimes called, um, is offered in violet. And the first prayer, in many ways, encapsulates um, and uh, the thoughts uh, the intentions uh, of the whole liturgy. So I just want to uh, read that to you. O Holy Lord, Father Almighty, Eternal God, who didst create all things out of nothing, and by thy command didst cause this liquid to come by the labour of bees to the perfection of wax, and on this day didst fulfil the petition of the just man Simeon, we humbly beseech thee that by the invocation of thy most holy name and by the intercession of blessed Mary of a Virgin, whose festival is this day devoutly celebrated, and by the prayers of all thy saints, thou wouldst vouchsafe to bless and sanctify these candles for the use of men, and the health of bodies and souls, whether upon the earth or in the waters, and wouldst hear from thy holy heaven and from the seat of thy majesty the voices of this thy people, who desire to bear them with honour in their hands, and to praise thee with hymns, and would be propitious to all that call upon thee, whom thou hast redeemed with the precious blood of thy Son, who lives and reigns with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, God, world without end. Amen. So there, all the themes of um, uh, the liturgy are basically encapsulated uh, within uh, that first prayer. The second prayer of sanctifying uh, again speaks uh, to um, Simeon and the temple. The third prayer uh, speaks uh, more to the uh, candles and to chastity and to purity and to Our Lady. The fourth prayer speaks to uh, light uh, in general. Um, makes reference to Moses, uh, who does command the purest oils to be prepared by thy servant Moses to keep lamps continually before thee, so referring to the blessing of the candles which then of course will be used uh, for the altar. 
that they may so afford external light that by thy gift the light of thy spirit may not fall, fail interiorly in our minds. And then in the fifth prayer, again, references made to the incarnation of Lord Jesus Christ, who appearing this day among men in the substance of our flesh, wert presented by thy parents in the temple, whom the venerable old man Simeon enlightened by the light of thy spirit, new received and blessed. Mercifully grant that enlightened and taught by the grace of the same Holy Spirit, we may truly acknowledge thee and faithfully love thee. Then after the blessing, uh, so the blessing of the candles takes place at the epistle corner of the altar, which if you are looking at an eastward facing altar is the left, uh, sorry, is the right corner as you're facing the altar. It's on the right corner, um, just as on Palm Sunday, likewise. Um, the candles will be to the left, uh, sorry, to the right uh, of the epistle corner. The blessing takes place there. After the end of the prayers, uh, incense and holy water uh, are uh, presented to the candles in blessing. Um, and then uh, is sung the Nunc Dimittis. So the antiphon, Lumen et revelationem gentium, a light to the revelation of the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And then, of course, the famous Canticle of Simeon uh, is sung. Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to enlighten the Gentiles and to be the glory of thy people Israel. And during uh, the singing of the Nunc Dimittis, uh, the candles are then distributed uh, to the faithful. And they are distributed in the traditional way, um, like uh, communion. Uh, so the faithful come up, they kneel um, at the altar rail, uh, they kiss the hand of the priest, and then the candle, they receive the candle, um, and uh, it is as it were, expressive of that theme of meeting, of meeting. Here, Christ meets them uh, in uh, the flame of the candle. They receive the light of Christ uh, themselves, which they, of course, are then bid uh, to take into the world. Uh, remember that Ite Misa Est, at the end of Mass, is a sending out. Uh, misa coming from Missio, mission, uh, sending out. And the same thing then um, occurs with the four mass. Uh, a prayer uh, at the end of the distribution uh, is said, Hear thy people, we beseech thee, O Lord, and grant that we may obtain those things within by the light of thy grace, which thou permittest us outwardly to venerate in this yearly devotion. The deacon will say, Ne procedamus in pace, let us go in peace, and everyone replies in the name of Christ, and then we go in procession. Now the wonderful thing, um, about uh, the procession um, is of course that it is expressive of us as a pilgrim people um, remember that uh, uh, scripture and thematically in liturgy and theology uh, we are likened to uh, in many ways the Israelites in the wilderness we are the chosen people of God we are the new Israel but whilst we are on earth of course we are in a kind of exile we are citizens of heaven made so by a baptism but we exist here on earth. We are separated, separated um, from uh, heaven. So uh, the procession then itself speaks to the nature of us as a pilgrim people. We who are going through this journey of faith in life uh, with the hope of attaining, um, of reaching home, uh, of reaching the promised land, of attaining to the kingdom of heaven, to the kingdom of God. Um, so as we process uh, with our candles around the church, uh, sometimes uh, it's possible to go uh, outside, depending, of course, on the weather. It's always preferable uh, to do so. Um, we had the uh, pleasure last year of uh, celebrating Candle Mass in the Philippines, um, and uh, we had a wonderful uh, procession uh, outside the church. Uh, it was sunny. It was very hot. 
it was very unusual um, for me to experience candle mass in the sunshine uh, and in uh, um, uh, what for us in the UK would be like summer type temperatures. Um, nonetheless, uh, we off we went in procession, some 200 of us walking the streets with lighting candles, uh, singing Ave in praise of Our Lady's uh, purification uh, and the Salve Regina uh, as we turned every corner. Uh, a wonderful sight and a wonderful uh, act of witness. Um, many people came out um, and either joined in uh, the procession uh, or, or waved and, and bid us well um, as we passed by. Um, as we passed by as uh, the pilgrim uh, people of God, uh, of God's chosen uh, people, the new Israel here on earth, a great act of witness. Um, while uh, the procession happens, uh, if there is a sacristan, uh, they are busily uh, engaged uh, changing the altar uh, from uh, violet into white or gold. So that when uh, the procession uh, returns to the church, um, they will behold, as it were, a vision uh, of heaven. Uh, so that as the pilgrim people of God who have walked in darkness but uh, with a light, with the light of the world uh, as it is, as, as they come to their journey's end so they behold the great vision um, of heaven uh, that awaits uh, all of us, uh, of course, hopefully. Um, so you can imagine in those churches particularly um, uh, where the, the uh, uh, altar is uh, particularly richly uh, dressed, uh, it can make quite an impact uh, returning uh, to the um, church and seeing the altar all lit up, uh, the sacristan having lit all the candles again um, and put all the lights on and uh, taken away the violet paraments and put upon uh, the gold and the white, a glorious uh, spectacle, indeed a revelation uh, of light. Uh, and of hope. And during uh, the procession, of course, uh, we hear uh, various anthems, uh, the first of which, which comes to us from uh, that original Byzantine liturgy that was offered in the East on the feet of the meeting, um, which reads, O Zion, adorn thy bridal chamber and welcome Christ the King. Embrace Mary, for she who is the very gate of heaven bringeth to thee the glorious King of the new light. Remaining ever virgin in her arms, she bears her son, begotten before the day star, whom Simeon, receiving into his arms, declared unto all peoples to be the Lord of life and of death and the Saviour of the world. Again, um, rich uh, in symbolism uh, and, and meaning. Um, and that antiphon uh, originally composed by St. Saint John of Damascus and that is then followed uh, with another antiphon uh, from Luke Simeon received an answer from the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen Christ of the Lord. And when they brought the child into the temple, he took him into his arms and blessed God and said, Now dost thou dismiss thy servant, O Lord, in peace. When his parents brought in the child to Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him in his arms. So those are the two antiphons that are sung uh, during the procession. Uh, of course, um, other hymns uh, may be added or other anthems uh, may be sung. But when the procession returns uh, to the church and the clergy to the sanctuary, then is heard the responsory. They offered for him to the Lord a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons, as it is written in the law of the Lord. After the days of the purification of Mary, according to the law of Moses, were fulfilled, they carried Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord etc. Um, so 
uh, that concludes then uh, the procession uh, of Candlemas and all of it speaking to this meeting particularly uh, of Simeon speaking of this um, meeting of uh, the Christ uh, with uh, those who were promised uh, to see him and likewise ourselves so we as the pilgrim people of God who have been on procession uh, lights in the darkness come then to see the vision uh, of heaven uh, and of Christ and this of salvation um, so all of that uh, is uh, those are all the uh, themes uh, within uh, that four mass uh, at the beginning of candle mass um, and then of course uh, the introit shushapimus now of course um, Apologies, uh, I had a note there that I wanted to share, let me just see if I can, it will still work this way. Now, already at Vespers this evening, um, uh, we've made this connection uh, between uh, Christmas and uh, uh, the presentation and this point again is made here. Um, so the Sushemus, We have received thy mercy, O God, in the midst of thy temple, according to thy name, O God. So also is the praise unto the ends of the earth. That uh, was the intro on the octave day uh, of Christmas. Uh, in other words, the Mass on New Year's Day, which of course is the Feast of uh, the Circumcision. Um, and that theme is then reconnected, um, as it were, uh, with the uh, Mass of uh, the presentation of Candlemas, uh, bringing, as it were, things um, full cycle. Now, during the Mass, um, candles will be lit again. So, when everyone's come in from uh, the procession, and the mass begins um, everyone blows out their candles it's kind of a shame really because in many ways I suppose the ideal would, to, would be to keep the candles lit but um, you would need to have very tall uh, candles and they could be very expensive for everyone um, so the candles are briefly extinguished but they are lit again um, they are lit again at the gospel <coughs> and for the canon uh, they're lit again during the preface so, of course, in a solemn mass, in a uh, sung mass, uh, the uh, gospel, uh, when it is proclaimed, is always accompanied by uh, lights, by acolytes carrying torches or carrying candles. Um, and they, essentially, are representing what it is that all of us do on candle mass when our lights are lit again uh, for the reading of the Gospel. And that's because we consider that Christ is present uh, in the Gospel. Um, so ordinarily, we might say that we should be, all of us, lighting candles and holding candles at every Mass whenever the um, uh, Gospel is read, but the acolytes fulfil uh, generally that duty and responsibility for us but on Candlemas uh, we do that ourselves and likewise of course then for uh, the canon uh, everyone's candle is lit again and obviously this time to hail the presence of Christ in the Blessed Sacrament um, and again ordinarily the acolytes and the torchbearers uh, would do that in a solemn mass on our behalf 
uh, but at Candlemas uh, we get to do that as an expression ourselves. In the off, uh, so the So in the uh, four mass, we had that theme of meeting, meeting uh, of man's word and God's word. We might say in the four mass, we uh, the presentation of Christ, who is the word, and of the word spoke by Simeon. And then in the um, and then the sacrifice proper, of course. Uh, man's bread meets God's bread. Um, uh, the bread that we offer in the Holy Eucharist becomes, of course, the bread of life. Now, the lesson that is taken from the prophet Malachi, who is the last of the prophets, tells how the Messiah would appear in the temple. And in the Gospel, of course, that prophecy is fulfilled. But it is fulfilled again in a higher manner during the sacrifice proper when the sovereign ruler, the messenger of the covenant, appears on our altar. Today he comes to us as the king of the new light, a light so bright that no mortal eye can endure it, so glowing that it refines our gold. And at the offertory we accompany Mary to the altar as she offered her pair of doves, um, but also the Son of God. So, of course, do we offer ourselves, our souls and bodies, as we said, as a living sacrifice with the ultimate sacrifice of Christ uh, upon the cross for us. At Holy Communion, essentially, we take the role of Simeon, the anointed, who was promised to see the Messiah, and we ourselves make our Holy Communion at Candlemas we ourselves behold and receive uh, the Messiah. So I just share with you uh, now some um, thoughts. Several Old Testament prophets had foretold how the temple's greatest glory was reserved for the day when the Messiah appeared in its sacred precincts and revealed himself. Their oracles are now fulfilled. Today Jesus enters his father's house for the first time. In future years he will often manifest himself there as the Messiah and the Son of God. Considerable prominence is given to this truth in the words of the introit, the gradual and in the epistle. And the temple of old is typified, of course, by the church. Today the infant saviour is brought to the temple and offered to God. According to Mosaic law, as we've said, every male firstborn was holy to the Lord. He was to be brought to the temple and redeemed by an offering. In our Lord's case, the act assumed a deeper significance. God does not give his son away gratis. His presentation at Mary's hands constituted, we might say, the offering of his life. If we align Christ's redemptive life with the Mass, his presentation in the temple then would be the offertory. His death on the cross would be the consecration and elevation. Today the Divine Lamb lies on the pattern of sacrifice and is offered to the Father. Thirty-three years hence, he will complete the act by dying on the cross. This day commemorates the ablation of Christ's whole redemptive work, not excluding the offertory ablations of all believers. Today our Blessed Mother offers her purificatory sacrifice as required by the Mosaic law in Leviticus. With humility and with a true spirit of sacrifice, she brings the offering of the poor, pair of doves. In imitation and in remembrance of her holy act, the Church commends to mothers that laudable practice 
uh, that liturgical blessing of after childbirth, of course, we know as the churching of women. And in doing so, of course, she thanks God for the successful delivery and offers her beloved infant to God. And this purification for us as Christians, or for Christian women, um, is not a rite of purification as it was for the Old Testament. Um, but here we recognize uh, Mary's humility and imitate her um, by this um, churching of women. So, as we said, Candlemas uh, marks the end of the Christmas cycle. In remembrance of the divine gifts uh, bestowed by the Christmas mystery, the Church gives us a candle. And the candle's message is that we are always retain Emmanuel, God with us. And remember that God is with us essentially in three ways. And the Church indicates these by handing us a candle and requesting us to hold it at the Gospel and during the Canon and indeed to take it home after the service. We possess Christ, A, in the Word of God, principally in the Gospel, B, in the Eucharist, as the Bread of Life, and C, in grace, by the way in which we live our lives in communion with God. That's something indeed worth considering and remembering uh, tomorrow. These th three um, aspects, uh, these three gifts that the liturgy and the Holy Mother Church and indeed God gives us tomorrow. The remembrance of the gift of faith and the possession of the gospel, the gift of the sacrament of God's love in Christ in the Holy Eucharist and then of course of that grace that God gives us to sustain us and to nourish us through our lives as Christians this pilgrim people on earth who are yet fed this new manna from heaven uh, to sustain us so all these are the themes contained uh, within uh, the liturgy uh, of Candlemas. I could have gone, as always, deeper and further, um, but uh, probably your patience wouldn't allow. But I hope um, that uh, you found it interesting, and I hope uh, that tomorrow, if you're able to attend the liturgy of Candlemas, or whether you're able to participate spiritually online, um, that you will be able to do so with a, with a deeper appreciation and understanding uh, of the liturgy, of what's being um, commemorated, what's being celebrated, what's being represented, and what we should take away uh, ourselves from the whole experience. And particularly, I think, um, as we uh, reflected um, last Saturday evening in Old Romans Unscripted, um, we might think, as we are now in Jessima season, of Anna and Simeon as patrons for us. Um, Jessima, of course, is the pre-season of Lent, is um, a time for reflection, uh, a time to look at our uh, the condition of our spiritual selves, um, to identify what needs to be addressed, perhaps, uh, by discipline in Lent. Um, but Anna and Simeon, might be for us, as I say, patrons for this season of Jessima, speaking as they do to the reward that is given to those who are faithful to God. Um, those of you familiar with uh, the Daily Mass will know that our motto during Lent is God is faithful to those who are faithful to him. And we see here in Anna, we see here in Simeon, they are rewarded for their fidelity. Anna, for her fidelity, um, always being in the temple, her, seeing her whole life, offering her whole life as an act of worship in, 
in prayer and praise to God. Likewise, as we've reflected before, my brothers and sisters, should our lives as Christians be lived as a continual act of worship, continual act of sacrifice in praise and thanksgiving. And after the manner of Simeon, we like Simeon are they who have received the promise and not only received the promise but have had it fulfilled. Though we sojourn in exile here on earth yet every day if we want to if we avail ourselves of the opportunity at mass every day we see our Messiah every day we see Jesus we see our salvation we live our salvation and we know that our salvation um, will be uh, made whole and completed uh, for us um, and during this season of Jessima you might think back uh, to the procession of Candlemas um, that though clothed as it were in violet yet we carry the light of Christ with us hope in darkness and particularly during these uh, days of Covid and the pandemic these uh, analogies of, of darkness and light um, are so, of course, uh, relevant uh, in many ways uh, to what we're experiencing uh, ourselves at the present time when there is um, so much uneasiness, um, so much that is disconcerting, uh, where there is um, a little bit of confusion, uh, we might even say chaos, um, yet uh, we who remain steadfast and faithful to God will, will uh, behold uh, the light of Christ in our lives. Each day for us, as it were, is like a mini procession of Candlemas. Each day for us is uh, a little pilgrimage uh, of faith as we sojourn here in this veil of tears, exiled as we are. Uh, from our heavenly home. Nonetheless, we have our hope. We have our Christian hope. We have uh, the promise of redemption and of salvation. Indeed, we are living it as Christians. And we are, of course, to become ourselves the meeting. We ourselves are to become the meeting place of God with not only ourselves, but for others too. And again, I always think that's a very important um, uh, aspect of the uh, Mass, particularly that uh, so many miss. That ite misa est literally is a dismissal to go out and to be uh, the, the gospel to the world. And we who celebrate, uh, of course, the light of Christ, the gift of the light of Christ to us, um, ought to seek to radiate and share uh, that light uh, through us and from us uh, to others. So, my brothers and sisters, there is Candlemas, and that was uh, Lumen Gentium. So that was our series of the Christmas in Epiphany Tide uh, liturgies. Um, now, we will uh, continue with a new series um, looking at uh, the... Uh, liturgy of uh, Jessima and Lent and leading up to um, uh, Passion Tide and uh, Holy Week because again uh, there is so much um, within the liturgies and of course in Lent um, Holy Church provides a mass for every single day of Lent um, so the ferias of Lent whereas for the rest of the year a feria invariably means repeat the mass of Sunday or repeat the Mass of the Last Feast. Um, in Lent, uh, uh, there is a set Mass for every day of the Lenten Feria. So, from Sunday through to Saturday. Um, and there are some great themes, uh, some great lessons uh, that we can draw uh, from those Masses. So it would be a shame uh, not to have the opportunity to uh, explore those. So... Um, beginning soon um, will be our exploration and journey through Lent uh, with the Liturgy of Lent. Also beginning soon will be a series called The Domestic Church uh, wherein we're going to um, explore the practicalities um, as well as the theology but also the practicalities of um, 
living this meeting, living this um, temple life uh, as Christians uh, at home as well as uh, with and in and at uh, church. So the domestic church and also to um, a new series, the persecuted church. Um, so following on really from Contra Mundum, uh, the persecuted church, uh, which will look at um, contemporary um, uh, persecution uh, in church today um, uh, and also uh, compare it with and, and look back uh, at times uh, in our history of persecution and what the church learned, what Christians learned or how they dealt uh, with persecution in those times. So that's three new series uh, beginning soon. Um, uh, journey through Lent with the liturgy, uh, the domestic church and the persecuted church um, and also running alongside there will be um, uh, some catechesis um, and an inquirers um, uh, program as well. Now they will take the form of um, Zoom, a Zoom conference um, and uh, will not be um, broadcast. So they won't be a public broadcast. Uh, if you want to participate in those, uh, you will have to register and sign up uh, to be given um, uh, access and a password for Zoom uh, so that you can participate in the uh, group discussion. Um, so there will be two classes offered. Uh, one, uh, an inquirer's uh, class uh, reflective of the catechumenate um, and another uh, for uh, uh, Christians uh, uh, of catechesis. So look out for details of those uh, coming soon. Otherwise, um, thank you uh, for watching. Uh, the next broadcast will be the Liturgy of Candlemas uh, tomorrow from 8.30 a.m. GMT London, uh, offered in the traditional uh, rite. Um, so I hope uh, that as many of you as are able will uh, join me for that spiritually, virtually, uh, online. Um, it's a great pity, of course, um, I know, and I owe some of you who, you know, some of the parishioners here, for example, um, will miss uh, not being present um, at Candlemas, but um, better to be safe um, and, and sure and, uh, you know, as a practice and exercise of charity, look after each other. Um, but nonetheless, um, the liturgy will still be offered and uh, there will still be the candles will still be blessed and um, sacramentals will be able to uh, be picked up later um, for your use at home in the domestic church uh, there you go can't say better than that um, so that's the next broadcast tomorrow 8 30 a.m gmt london time uh, followed later of course at midday with the angelus and in the evening with the angelus and uh, contemplative rosary uh, so i hope as many of you uh, as possible and are as able will join us for one or other or all of those broadcasts um, tomorrow meanwhile take care of yourselves look after each other look after others and uh, remember always uh, that god loves you.